that review the zoning, we issue a letter of eligibility, provided you know, the zoning meets all the requirements and the district is, uh, location is eligible. The community adopts the zoning and then it comes back to us for uh, just verification that it actually is consistent with what we had approved as eligible and then we issue a letter of approval and at that point uh, applicants can begin proposing uh, projects within the district. Uh, just quickly, that's uh, sort of the distribution of ex existing districts to date. We have 36 districts, um, s very soon to be 39. Uh, this slide here shows you the size. Those uh, numbers in red uh, are the size of the districts, um, or at least the net new units in the district. Uh, we have zoned uh, over, almost 13,000 units have been zoned. <coughs> and uh, around 2,900 have been, are built or in construction. Those communities that are listed, in, are shown in green, are uh, the districts that have produced units at this point. And uh, we have three uh, currently eligible or pending districts. Uh, this shows you some of the funds that there are, the funds that have been received by communities that have been participating so far. The, Three communities that are in red are communities that have taken advantage of, or sorry, the red rectangle around them are communities that have taken advantage of the uh, Chapter 40S, the school cost reimbursement. So <coughs> the number you see there is the combined 40R and 40S payments. And just quickly, some, uh, an, you know, a couple of examples. This is a small district in Belmont. And you can see the graphic there on the right uh, shows you, you can have different sub-districts that have different characteristics. Um, I'm realizing that I sort of uh, skipped over the, the density allowances, which are uh, 20 units an acre, and this is what the zoning must allow on the developable or underutilized parcels. So not necessarily every parcel in the district. Must allow, if, you're, if you zone for multifamily, you need to allow at least 20 units an acre does not have to be built to that threshold, but has to allow for it. Uh, eight units an acre for single family and 13 units an acre for two or three family. Um, sorry, that was uh, Redding. Um, that's a, uh, this was a former grocery store site there uh, near the train station, uh, was vacant at the time and redeveloped into a four story mixed use building with ground floor retail. Uh, this is uh, Northampton, Village Hill, an old state hospital site, um, which does not occupy that whole area shown. Uh, and uh, uh, we had Ted Tai from National Development, for those who attended the, uh, is that Monday night? Uh, yeah, uh, the Route 9 presentation. Uh, he was one of the panelists. This is National Development's uh, Arbor Point at Market Street up in Linfield. Um, which was proposed as sort of actual vertical, you know, mixed use, but ultimately was developed uh, as sort of a uh, residential development next to uh, a so-called lifestyle center. And that's it. Did I, I don't know how I did in terms, in terms of time there, but. I think you're doing very well okay. indeed. And I, I would even say, uh, just because what you presented is a lot of data probably is new. Yep. Into the microphone. Um, maybe what we might do right now is if there are any questions just that are fact-based based on this presentation. Otherwise, we'll go forward. We're going to have plenty of opportunity for questions later. But is there anything that you are confused about or didn't understand in this part of our presentation? Okay. We'll move right along. Uh, now. Yes, we, we have to do the technical thing. And okay, Roger Blood, what happened to Roger? There you are. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so now, now we're gonna hear something that is a little more Brookline specific. Mr. Blood. Thank you, Betsy. Uh, first of all, thanks to the league, um, not just for <coughs> this particular session tonight, but for adopting. 
I think for the, the year, the better part of the year, the, the topic of affordable housing. Uh, this is the second of uh, several uh, sessions, um, and that's, uh, that's great for those of us that are especially interested in affordable housing and, and advancing ideas in this area uh, here in Brookline. Um, the, uh, it's, a, it's a particularly interesting time right now. I think that the, uh, the town is in, a, in a, a, really a transition and facing some challenges that we, uh, we haven't had before <laughs> up until now. And uh, so I, I hope in the, not only the brief period I'm going to make some remarks, but in the, especially in the Q&A that, that follows that, uh, that you'll find some, uh, some food for thought from the, from the four of us really uh, on, on this subject. Uh, 10%, if I say that number, probably most of you know what I'm leading toward. Uh, the town adopted uh, this goal of having 10% of our total housing as officially uh, affordable. Uh, at least a decade ago in, the, in our um, 2005 comp plan. Um, and uh, for the last 10 years <clears throat> or more, there it's set. 10%, we've been at eight, a little more than eight maybe, and something like 500 units short of uh, 2,600 units of affordable, 10% of 26,000, which is the whole town's housing stock. Um, <clears throat> why, why are we in a transition right now? Um, because up until now, it was pretty easy to give lip service to the 10%. It was uh, almost impossible in most people's minds that reflected on it that we were going to get there in any realistic way. Uh, we, it was too costly. We didn't have enough land. Where would, in the world would Brookline find uh, the, 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 the subsidy resources and the sites, uh, not to mention the, the will to, to do over 500 units of affordable housing? Um, things have changed in the last couple of years um, where that 10% is now something that we, uh, the events have uh, kind of caught up with us because the market has moved uh, into a situation where we are now uh, within striking distance of the 10% in the real marketplace. And the town is faced with uh, the question of are we going to do whatever we can to guide that process as best as we can or will the market simply drive wherever it wants to go, and this, the state of Massachusetts behind them, overriding our local zoning as, uh, as uh, Chapter 40B can do, and uh, allowing some things to happen and some, some scale of development that, uh, that I think many of us would be uh, you know, not, not thrilled about uh, as compared with things that we might have uh, the ability to shape ourselves. We've been accustomed to shaping almost everything we've done in town uh, up until this point. Um, the, uh, following on a, on a town meeting resolution uh, in the spring town meeting, um, the, uh, the housing advisory board and the planning board um, have uh, retained a consultant to do a, um, what's known as a housing production plan. This is something that the state prescribes and uh, communities are encouraged to, to adopt a more or less formal plan on how they are going to get from wherever they happen to be, from our eight point something, uh, closer to nine. Uh, nine point something plus if uh, Hancock Village uh, were to materialize um, to the 10 percent. And um, so we are going to go be, be going through that process in the next six months and uh, uh, look forward to not only a good, good professional help but uh, engagement uh, with a lot of the interested uh, uh, parties in town and then with the general public. And so you'll be seeing some of these, um, these uh, well publicized uh, functions and exchanges to try and uh, have the community uh, not only understand the process and the need to get to the 10 percent, but to help decide on where and how uh, and in what form uh, the, the, uh, the developments, the specific sites and developments will take place to get there. Um, so this is going to be, uh, this is going to be a challenge because <laughs> it's not just about numbers and production uh, for sure. Um, uh, there, there, there are some conflict, conflicting forces and, and really objectives. Uh, that are going to be um, critical to us all along the way, and I'll just mention a, a few of them. Um, probably the main one is the, the, uh, the need to achieve the housing production, and this is basically new housing, with our very uh, strong feelings about our residential, our established residential neighborhoods and retaining the, uh, the character of those neighborhoods and not allowing them to be, um, to be un uh, inappropriately intruded upon by large-scale uh, development. 
the second, I think that, that there's probably um, a lot of uh, uh, people in town that are uh, very sincerely for affordable housing, but, but cautious about high density and high large scale development. So there's gonna be, uh, uh, th those two forces may be uh, something that needs to be uh, reconciled as best as we can. Um, and uh, th the market may wanna drive us in one direction and we may wanna drive where these uh, developments occur in a slightly different direction. And finally, um, I think just about everybody knows uh, on a lot of sites where there is potential for development, there are at least three uh, major competing uses and housing is one of the three. And, and um, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna be needing to work th those, those uh, competing forces through um, between affordable housing advocates and the, the siting of our schools. And then uh, as recently as a couple of nights ago, we had a great uh, forum uh, downstairs on economic development. And of course, there's a, the competing use for, uh, for uh, expanding the tax base with, with commercial development. Um, one ideal opportunity is to find places where we can do mixed use development that combines both uh, commercial and uh, housing. Um, I, I would like to take just a, a few minutes, at, if, if that kind of sets the stage for maybe some, some good discussion or Q&A at the end of this, <clears throat> to take a, a, a quick look at um, some of the, the capabilities uh, that the town has now to, um, to draw upon uh, as we try to um, achieve uh, some of these, these goals. Um, the housing division and the um, housing advisory board, which works hand in hand with the division in the, in the planning department, um, uh, really came about uh, with the transition from rent control over 20 years ago. And um, the, uh, at that time, and, and David Treach, who's uh, one, of, one of our fellow panelists here, was the, the godfather of, of a lot of this. The, uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the basic laws were set up for the, the HAB and the housing trust fund to give us local resources to work with. Um, and, and over that period of time, what's, what may be the most relevant today is not just look at what was done in the past, um, a, a, a really a remarkable, um, I'll, I'll call it kind of a toolkit or a set of, a, a, a combination of skill sets uh, backed up by resources uh, are now at the ready. Uh, and, it, and it's remarkable in the sense because the housing division is really two and a half people. Uh, and um, as I said, with the HAB, citizen support. And I just want to run through these very quickly. Um, I haven't had occasion to, to think about them in, in a while. Um, we've got inclusionary zoning, which mandates uh, developers of any, I mean, any size to make an affordable housing contribution, either in on-site units or money into the trust fund, <coughs> money which has totaled over $10 million uh, since uh, the trust fund first began. We have uh, the ability to do uh, friendly 40Bs, such as St. Aidan's, which is, uh, uh, again, significant dollars, but also a skill set and the experience to, uh, to come to the table and make a 40B work in a collaborative way. <clears throat> We've been through um, the, uh, the process of uh, disposing of town-owned property for the sake of achieving affordable housing goals, such as uh, occurred up on Olmstead Hill, and Betsy DeWitt deserves years of credit and effort for bringing it to the point where um, people like the Housing Advisory Board could actually uh, look, start looking at and negotiating the specifics. Um, we've uh, focused on, on uh, lodging houses over the years, and you're gonna hear Jan Griffin uh, speak uh, shortly about one uh, uh, a terrific partnership that the town has had that's, uh, that's been successful. Uh, a mission-driven sponsor partnering with the town uh, and the town's trust fund uh, to serve a particular group of, of, uh, of needs and beneficiaries, um, uh, uh, which moves towards our, one of our goals, which is diverse uh, beneficiaries. Um, uh, another is the purchase and rehab of um, existing housing for affordable rentals. Betsy showed you the picture of 154, 156 uh, Boylston Street, which, is, which was a, a good example of that. Another is the... Uh, um, the, in, the purchase of individual condominium units in market rate buildings <clears throat> and then attaching the deed restriction, reselling the unit in a lottery for permanent affordability. Not large volume, but, um, but another, another uh, tool in the, in the toolkit. 
1600 Beacon Street up near Washington Square, a large, a large uh, apartment building has several affordable units in it. Um, the, um, uh, we have two homeownership assistance, uh, uh, down payment assistance, homeownership programs that have worked in small numbers over the years, but again, one more, one more capability. Uh, one is down payment assistance for uh, units where the, uh, the, the uh, unit is permanently deed restricted um, after uh, uh, being, being acquired. The other um, is uh, something called a shared appreciation mortgage program where uh, the buyer uh, gets access to an affordable unit um, and the town's uh, uh, stake in that unit for the long term is that when it sells, the town gets a, a, a good share of the appreciation when the unit is sold. Um, uh, you, you've heard a bit about the preservation of existing units in expiring use buildings. Um, uh, the old Roger Stern buildings in Hebrew Rehab was a good earlier example that the town put a million dollars in to keep um, units uh, uh, affordable. And um, uh, more recently, the Juniper Street co-ops down in the, uh, in the village uh, was, uh, was done in the same way. <clears throat> One thing that uh, many people um, aren't aware of, and it's a, it's a small program, but really very important, the, the, um, the, the town has a foreclosure prevention fund. Some of our trust fund monies have been set aside uh, and earmarked in case an existing affordable owner faces foreclosure or, or uh, distress. <coughs> For example, um, uh, one, one success in that area was a condominium on Winchester Street where there was a major renovation that raised the assessment so much that the affordable owner uh, was unable to, um, to afford it and we were able to save the, uh, the, uh, the owner's unit from foreclosure with a, with a disbursement from, the, uh, from this particular fund. The housing, uh, just a couple more and then uh, uh, I'll, I'll uh, finish up. Uh, the, our housing division operates a help desk uh, essentially for anybody that has questions or needs or concerns about their own situation. Um, it, it's not just providing affordable units but referrals to all other, all other kinds of housing resources and even, even social services. Um, that particular activity is, is, um, is backstopped by a, a list serve uh, of uh, people who have put their names on a, a, a list of over 3,000 uh, individuals and households who want to be notified uh, by the town, by the housing division, when there's um, an opportunity uh, or a lottery that might come up for an affordable housing uh, situation that might meet their needs. Um, uh, the last two are, again, within the housing division more than the HAB, but the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the staff monitors all of the affordable housing in town. Uh, there was a lot of questions when the programs began whether we would be watchful to make sure that there weren't um, abuses or loss of affordability or, or anything like that over time. So that when, when units um, are resold that are affordable, they come back through the town and individual units are, are um, requalified through a lottery that the town uh, runs from time to time uh, to make sure that the affordability continues for new owners. And finally, uh, the housing division um, is very active with fair housing uh, and, and works with the um, the Commission for Diversity, Inclusion, and, and Community Relations, which is, um, again, something that may tend to get forgotten or put on the side when we talk about affordable housing, but it's, uh, it's an extremely important activity. So I, I, I run those things off very quickly, uh, only for the sake of, um, as we talk about how do we get to our goals, there, there is this wide range of toolkits that can be used um, uh, as opportunities arise or as we create those opportunities for, um, for moving ahead. Thanks very much, and, and I will have to say, over my career in public activities in Brookline and engagement with affordable housing, I would never have been able to come up with all of those programs, and I am totally amazed that they all exist. Um, but it does somewhat illustrate, I think, the complicated, actually complexity, of creating affordable housing, no matter how strongly you may want to have it. Um, there are many, many different approaches, and um, some of them are going to work in one situation and not in another. So it's, it's not as easy as it sounds. Now, we're going to take a short technical break while we try to get the Pine Street <laughs> project up on the screen. Now, is, is that the right thing? No, that's you. Okay, I don't know what happened to me.
Where do you think the thumb drive is? Is it there? One of these? Yes, yes. It's the one. Um, Oop. Yeah. Um, go up one more. Pine Street? Yeah, Pine Street. That Affordable housing is probably easier than this, right? Okay. And here is our next speaker coming from a different and interesting perspective. So Jan Griffith, Pine Street Inn. Thank you, Betsy. I just need one more moment of your time to know oh. how to go to the next slide. You click push, push this. Push that down. Down. Yeah. Very good. Great. Go. Okay. Right. Okay, great. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Margaret. And thank you to the League for having this evening. Um, I was thrilled when Betsy called me and asked me if I would come tonight and talk about Pine Street Inn's partnership. Oh, good, thank you. I was thrilled when Betsy called me and asked me if I would come tonight and talk about Pine Street Inn's partnership with the town of Brookline. So if you did not know that the Pine Street Inn had affordable housing here in Brookline, you might be asking why? Why am I here and why is there this partnership? And I'll tell you, it's for two basic reasons. And one is the same reason why you live here. Brookline is a wonderful community. It has amenities galore. It has fabulous, fabulous public transportation. And the housing stock is to die for. It's beautiful. It's, you know, and you, Betsy has already preempted me a little bit and shown some of our pictures. But it's a wonderful, beautiful, safe, place to live. And that's reason number one we're here. Reason number two is Brookline does not have um, an emergency shelter for people who become homeless in your town. So that's true of many towns and many cities. Chelsea doesn't have, an aff have a shelter either. And so people in that situation when they become homeless find, seek, out an, <coughs> seek out an emergency shelter like Pine Street. Not always at Pine Street, maybe the city of Boston shelter, different shelters, but last year we had 19 people come to the Pine Street Inn for shelter who were last housed in Brookline. So that's another piece of the partnership. We're here over in Boston to provide shelter when Brookline needs an emergency shelter bed for individuals. We only serve individuals, not families. So that's the why. Um, just a little trip down memory lane for me um, and Pine Street. So Pine Street was founded in 1969 on Pine Street in Chinatown. And in 1980, we moved to the south end of Boston in the iconic Boston Fire Headquarters building. And we bought the, quickly bought the building right next door and established two large shelters, one for men and one for women. In the late 1970s, the early 80s, when we first moved there in 1980, we had space galore. And in 1981, we had every bed filled and mats on the floor with people sleeping mat to mat in the lobby. So overnight, and the reason for that was deinstitutionalization was really you know, ramping up and going strong, and condo conversion. So the South End really was a lodging house district. And Brookline had a, a lot of lodging houses also. And the conversion of those buildings without proper relocation for the tenants who were there. And we, we, I, I've been at Pine Street a long time, <laughs> over 20 years, and met people who just, you know, the night before were in their lodging house and the owner just said, hmm, I, I've sold it, you have to go. And people would leave because they didn't know they had rights around that. So those two big things caused the Pine Street Inn Board of Directors to take a big step backwards and say, what are we doing? Every year in the wintertime, we would set up um, 
temporary shelters in armories. We did it at the BU Armory, all different armories um, around Metro Boston, and we would bus people to those armories because winter was obviously a critical time of year. So are we gonna keep doing this? Are we gonna keep expanding shelter? Or are we gonna solve the problem? So we took the giant step of buying our first lodging house in Brookline. So we've done a lot of firsts in Brookline. So we bought the lodging house, which is um, on the left-hand side, the top, with the two green side-by-side -side doors at 1043, 1045 Beacon Street. And that was our foray into Brookline. Um, that lodging house itself has um, 28 units, and as I said, it was our first building. Today, we have 39 buildings, all different shapes and sizes, and we also lease scattered site apartments, and all totaled, we have 900 units of affordable housing that the agency runs. Um, initially, when we got into this world, we had a continuum of care for people where you'd come to the Pine Street Inn, you'd get a shelter bed, our counselors would work with you and we'd say, oh, we have this great transitional program and you can stay here for 24 months and we'll teach you all sorts of things and you'll get clean and sober and so on and so forth. And then we'll get you a housing unit. We don't do that anymore. The transitional piece is gone. And it's gone for many reasons, but most of all, it's a fast track into housing. If you're homeless today, there's no reason for you to stay in a shelter for months and months and months. If we can find you a unit and we have the support services to wrap around you, we wanna get you out of the Pine Street Inn as soon as possible and into community-based housing. So today, no transitional programs. You go right from the shelter into housing. Um, and let's see, success. So our vision, again today, this wasn't our vision in 1969 at all, but our vision today is a permanent home and a community for everyone. And that's the trajectory that we are on. I just wanted to show you this piece quickly to, so that you can sort of know our, you know, where we're going and why we're going. So, you know, the world, there's only so much, so many pieces of pie. There's only so much money that goes around, right? So we need to figure out how to use the pie differently. We get funding from the federal government for rental subsidies. We get money from the state for shelter resources, and we get money from the state also for rental subsidies. So in 2002, the blue um, piece of that, that um, bar graph is the housing units, and the green part are the shelter beds. So in 2002, we had 715 shelter beds and 280 units of housing. Move down the chart by fiscal year 2009, we're getting fairly even. We have 691 in terms of shelter bed and 513. Then, so all it was well, we, were, we want to have more um, housing units than we have shelter beds. All was going along swimmingly until we merged with Hope Found which was the Shattuck Shelter um, in 2012. And the Shattuck Shelter had 12 units of housing and 180 shelter beds. So then, our, our, then we had to kind of recalibrate the, um, the chart. And so we stalled out for a little while there. And now, as you'll see down to the end on the right of the chart, we now have um, 905 units of housing and 670 shelter beds. As you'll see, the 670 is fairly static now. We are not able to take down shelter beds because the demand is so high. Um, earlier in um, 2003, 2004, we were shutting down shelter beds and using that money to support people in permanent housing. So ho we're hoping that things get better going forward, but right now we're a little stuck um, in our 670 shelter beds, needing to keep them up because the demand is, um, is so high. I just need a good drink of water. So this is our, um, our, again, our 
building on Beacon Street. When you think about supportive housing, it's basically a three-legged stool. We need capital, obviously, to acquire it and to renovate it. We need rental subsidies because the people that we serve in housing are extremely low income. They're well below 30% of the area median income. Some people come into our housing with no income at all. And then our case managers work with them to get them the income that they need, e either a disability program, maybe a part-time job, something like that. But we do house people with zero income and then work to get them income. And the third leg of the stool is support services. The people who come to Pine Street, when they end up in our shelters, something has happened. For some people, it's a short episode and they move quickly out of shelter and can be fine on their own. It was just you know, one problem in life. Many, many people though, it was a long road into shelter and then often it's a long road out of shelter and some people need support long term. If people have mental health issues, if people have substance abuse issues, if people have both of those issues, we, our supportive housing is geared to support people so that they can have successful tenancies and become members of the community and succeed. Now, they might not be joining the Neighborhood Association tomorrow, you know, which is sort of what I did as soon as I moved into my community. I thought, oh, how can I get into this community? This is what I'll do. But the point is, we want people receiving services and knowing that they are a neighbor just like everyone else. They need to behave like a neighbor just like everyone else. And, all, and, and that's how things kind of go on from day to day. And so our case managers help people with that type of, um, that type of goals. The big thing about services is we will provide them ourselves, but better we'll, com we'll connect people to community-based services. So we work with Brookline Mental Health, we work with local AA and NA communities um, to get people what they need. We work with, um, with um, food pantries. If people, if, if they run out of money at the end of every month, we want connect them, to connect them to the local food pantry so they're not struggling with that. Fuel assistance, anything that makes life work is what our case managers are all about with people. Um, so just a little bit about the first. So this was our first building, as I said already. Um, it's 28 units of lodging house housing, very traditional lodging house. Everything is shared. The living room, the kitchens, the bathrooms. Each person has their own room. Um, this building, again, Betsy showed this building. This is 1754 Beacon Street. Um, Bic purchased this building you know, to really to gain site control so that it wouldn't be lost to the condominium market and then Pine Street bought it from Bic and redeveloped it. This was our first building with studio apartments. So in this building, there were nine lodging house units and five studios. And the line for the studios was around the block. Because if you think about it, you know, who really wants to share a bathroom with a whole bunch of different people? And is, wouldn't it be great to have your own kitchenette? So now going forward, what we're doing is either enhanced lodging house units with private baths and kitchenettes or studios or one bedrooms. But we learned that lesson right here in Brookline at 1754 Beacon Street in this beautiful building. This is the Sarah Wallace house, as again Betsy mentioned, at 1017 Beacon Street. This was a big first for Pine Street in that we manage this for BIC. We do the property management and we provide the support services to the tenants living in, in here. We had never done that for anybody else. And so, you know, social enterprise, you know, like, you know, kind of fireworks went off. Like, we can do this. We can do this for other agencies who might not have, might not want to, or might not have the expertise that our case management staff does in dealing with people that have some of the issues that come up. Um, when people are coming from shelter into housing. So we were thrilled that BIC had the confidence in us to let us manage this building, and we've gone on to manage for many other nonprofit organizations, mostly community development corporations in Boston and Chelsea. And this is 
so Beale Street is two side-by-side -side buildings. This is the building that's going to go into construction next. This is full of people right now. And this is the building. Betsy had that picture in her um, PowerPoint of the green building on the right. That's the completed building, and that's the before. And the wonderful thing about this building at 5557 Beals is that it's handicap accessible. So I don't know if you can see it. It's supposed to kind of blend in. It's got a lift on the right-hand side, that white door. And then the entire first floor of the building is accessible with two fully accessible units and a common space that's fully accessible. So we're very excited about that. This week, we received our, um, our certificate of occupancy for that building, and we're moving in this weekend. Um, for this building, the Beale Street properties were full before we started the construction, so we had to do relocation of people. So the people who are going to move into 5557 were already there. They were already living at Beale Street. So demand-wise, I don't have a good number on that, but just to tell you, we have two other projects that are opening um, in February and this spring. One is 31 units in Jamaica Plain, and the other is 12 one-bedroom units in Dorchester. For both of those buildings, we have, a, uh, we have a pool of 600 people. For each of those projects, 600 people. And they're very specific. You know, they're, they're again, supportive housing, affordable. So the, the demand is just enormous. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so that was a different view of affordable housing. And our final uh, speaker is David Treach, chair of the Brookline Housing Authority, uh, which is a sort of quasi-state, uh, it has a re relationship with the state government, yeah. It's a state authority, okay. It is a state authority, okay. Um, but the important thing about the housing authority in particular is that they are the largest operator, manager of affordable housing units. Um, with the new Dumber Street um, uh, opening, there will be about 950 uh, fixed units, that is to say, units that the housing authority owns and operates, some for seniors, some for people with disabilities, some for families. Um, but they also control a very important commodity called Federal Section 8 vouchers. And I understand there are about 900 of those. Some of them uh, you heard mentioned as site-based vouchers, which is to say some of the tenants who live in Pine Street in units have housing vouchers that they were able to receive through the Brookline Housing Authority. There are other buildings around town, some of them specific not-for-profit, um, uh, let's call it housing, but run by not-for-profits, that also have <laughs> Section 8 vouchers that they obtain through the um, Brookline Housing Authority. So it's not, it's a complicated set of responsibilities, partly the um, operating and management of housing, rental housing, and the uh, allocation of the additional 900 Section 8 vouchers. David. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Um, I wanted to do three things, actually, um, in this conversation. I wanted to talk a little bit about the challenge I wanted to tell you a bit about the BHA, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about strategies. So let me begin by asking, how many you, of you are homeowners in Brookline? Great. Um, how many of you think your children could afford to buy a house in Brookline? <laughs> God bless. Nice. Um, OK, for those of you who, who may only be watching me, if this is live anywhere, uh, we had a lot of hands go up for homeowners, and we had one hand go up for somebody who thought their child might be able to buy a house in Brookline. Um, this is, again, under the challenge thing. Um, so the, the reason I ask that is that we know that nationally and in the state and in Brookline that there are trends going on where we're getting polarized between people who are way up here and people who are down there in terms of what they can afford 
and, 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 and their future of what they're looking at in terms of the ability to live the life they want to live. And um, if you need further proof of that, um, I, I didn't bring a slide for you, but as you, as you leave the building tonight, um, as you leave Town Hall, if you look across, straight across the street, you'll see what looks like newly renovated housing. I don't know whether it's new construction or not, but there are three units there. And if you have $1.3 million, you can buy a two bedroom unit right across the street there. And it's a beautiful unit. You can see the photos um, on, on the internet, um, but it's $1.3 million. So don't run out now, but that's what's happening here in Brooklyn. Um, and, 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 and that's a, that's, so I want to say it's a national thing, it's a local thing, it's happening in Brookline, and, and I wanted to make that point. Um, so let me talk a little bit about what the Housing Authority does, and, and Betsy gave you a great intro. We house people who are of low income, and so about half of our units are families and half of our units are, are elderly, and their average incomes for elderly range typically between ten and twenty thousand dollars a year. That's their average incomes, and for families, it's probably between twenty and thirty-five or forty thousand a year, uh, depending on the number of kids. That, well, and, and and these are families that have two, three, four, five children, and um, and their ability to live in Brookline uh, has to do with available public housing in most cases. And, and the thing that we talk about. Um, in, in the importance of the housing authority and the, and the thousand units that we have is that when a, a family that otherwise could not afford to live in Brookline is given the opportunity to live in Brookline, it changes the trajectory of their family and the generations to come. Their kids all of a sudden can go to the Brookline school system. They have access to steps of success. They have access to Brookline community health and, 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 and public health. They have access to our parks and our backup. They now have a very different future than they would have if they live in, in a different community. And so this is like uh, something we provide that's way more than housing. Um, and so that's the function. And one of the things that's great about the Brookline Housing Authority, and I can say that because I don't do the work, I'm just on the board, um, is that most of you don't know where all our units are. We have about 10 different developments and then some scattered site, and you probably don't know where they are. Or maybe you know one or two. I grew up in, in New Jersey, and when I grew up, you knew where the public housing was. Everybody knew where the public housing was. It's where your parents say, don't go to that neighborhood and don't go through that place. But in Brookline, there are neighbors. And in Brookline, their housing looks like our housing. And so they live here, and, 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 and it's, a, it's, a, it's a real terrific thing that this town does in supporting us. We're a state agency, but a lot of what we do, do is in partnership with the town, with the state, with the federal government, we have lots of partners. For better or worse, they all have regulations that we live under, but we have lots of partners. Um, let me tell you about um, the, the, the new thing that we did, um, and Betsy mentioned it. Um, right now, um, over the last month or so, we opened the first new um, 32 units at Dummer Street, a new construction, permanently affordable, same population profile, and that's gonna be forever to that profile. We'll be living there, um, again, 32 families, um, worth of housing, we had 2,400 applications. 2,400 applications for 32 units of housing. Within the 32, we have three accessible units. We had 16 applications for those three units. 70% of the people moving into Dummer Street will be Brookline residents because that's what we're allowed to do, and we maximize that. Two of those families will be from our units elsewhere because they should have the same opportunity. And if you have a chance to get over there and look at it, it's just a phenomenal project. And in fact, not only are the units wonderful, but we rebuilt a courtyard where there's a new playground, a new open area. And we did that in part because the new units deserve them. But one of the reasons we were able to do this development, this, was, this is for Brookline an easy development. Let me define easy. Took about five years, took six or seven different funding sources, and we own the property around it. So all the abutters already live with us. They're our residents. Oh, and by the way, the one side that wasn't our residence that we own was Boston. And so 
you'll maybe get tired of hearing me saying that, the, all the shadow of the building falls on Boston. <laughs> and all our permeating folks seem to really enjoy that, so I keep saying that. <laughs> Um, so that's, and oh, and, and Betsy wanted me to talk a little bit, and I will talk about this important thing about the Section 8 certificates. So we manage a little, about four, 950 Section 8 certificates. These are federal certificates that for the most part go with the individual. The individual goes and finds an apartment, and the landlord has to say, yes, I will accept a Section 8 certificate. They then have to get certified. The apartment gets checked, and they then get that. However, the downside is the federal government's rate for what they will pay for a monthly rent is not up to the market in Brooklyn. And so most of our Section 8 certificates go outside of Brooklyn. They can go any place. And so while they're ours to manage, they're scattered throughout. The people who have the best chance of locating a Section 8 certificate in Brooklyn are uh, one bedroom. So uh, the, that, that's a little more comparable. So sometimes a landlord will trade the, the consistency and dependability of getting that check every month from the federal government and, and, and take a slightly lower rent. So we're good, we, we do that well. There's another subset of Section 8 certificates that I'll mention, and those are project-based. So again, you've got a guarantee rate from the federal government. If you're a developer and you're looking to build new and you want to rent things out, but you're not sure you're going to have the income to make the project work, if we designate eight or 10 Section 8 certificates to your project, they're now based in your project, they become a secure level of funding that you can count on. And so developers like that. So we've worked with the Pine Street Inn, we've worked with St. Aidan's, we've worked with most of the major affordable housing developments here to provide some of that. It's a great way to use the Section 8, place the people we want to place, and have them stay in Brooklyn. And that's what works. Okay, so that's the, that's the BHA. Oh, and by the way, I, I, I have to say, the thing that's really special about the BHA, other than our staff who are just wonderful, um, is the fact that we work in partnership in Brookline. So again, Steps to Success. I don't know if you know about the Steps to Success program. This is a national model. We start with fourth grade, and if you're a kid that comes from a, house, a, a household of low income, we will send a social worker to meet with you and a, guide, and a guidance counselor to meet with you and your family. And the whole thing about steps, steps is to help you develop a trajectory that you will eventually go to college. We support you, we support your family, and when I say we, I say the town of Brookline is the we. Brookline Community Mental Health, our foundation, the teacher, the school department, um, just, it's, it's just a whole network that supports that kid and that family and help them go, and the numbers are phenomenal in terms of who actually gets to college, goes through college, and every time this project gets, this program gets a year older, we extend the program, so now we have people visiting our kids at college to help support them and so on, and I'm sure soon we'll do an employment thing for the kids to graduate. Um, so now I want to talk, so that's the BHA, and that's what we do, and I'm sure there's a whole lot more we could talk about. Um, but what I wanted to get to in just a few minutes was this whole thing about um, strategies. Um, there are two strategies that I think come into play in terms of increasing affordable housing. First one, and the first one I think, is to preserve what you have. And so I'm here to tell you, and here's the pitch, most of public housing was built in the 1940s and 1950s and even though we get money to repair and keep upgrading it, not enough. Federal government will say they don't give us enough. The state doesn't give us enough. But we do the best we can. Some of those buildings are really running into their end of lifetime. You just can't. There are buildings where we replace mechanicals by going not to producers, but by antique stores. <laughs> I'm serious. We will find electrical parts by going to people who collect old whatever. I'm not going to tell you what parts. Um, but some of those buildings, um, not only are the systems at a point where they can't quite be replaced up to standard, but the size of the rooms, the size of the corridors, the bathroom-bedroom ratios, all of those no longer meet standards. And I'm telling you, there's going to come a point soon where we're going to need to reestablish 
those public housing units is going to cost a lot of money. It's going to be a big project. And here's the big issue that I, I, I mentioned every place I go, is that if you have 100 units of housing that were built in 1950, and you want to bring those units up to space standards, so the bedrooms are actually what are livable, not luxury, livable, you're going to increase the size of that building by about 30 to 50%. If you want to keep the same building envelope, you're going to reduce the number of units by 30 to 50 percent. So we have a challenge here because density is a big deal in Brooklyn. And height and all that is a big deal in Brooklyn. So we know that's going to be a challenge. So here's part of the answer. And this goes to the other strategy. The other strategy is we have to be innovators. We have to talk about smart growth. Smart growth. We need to talk about using our transportation network smartly so we don't have to have people have to have cars when they really don't need it. We need to look at mixed use development. And quite frankly, there's one development that I'm sort of getting involved in a little bit that's at a very preliminary stage, and that's the development they're talking about at Kehel of Israel in College Corner. That's a development that's in the middle of a commercial district where they're talking about a ground floor with some kind of a commercial use and housing above it for seniors. Seniors who don't need a lot of cars and a lot of parking, but have all the sort of benefits of the Coolidge Corner area. And again, Coolidge Corner, remember, here's we're always going to have a mix of students. We're always going to have a mix of young families. Having a mix of seniors, this is a really ideal location. There's a real innovative project that I think is being talked about and is about to happen there. And so let's keep an eye on that. And let's not only support it, but use it as a model to see what we should be doing elsewhere in town. And so preservation, being innovative, whether it's zoning, whether it's how we apply. I mean, Roger really talked about the incredible talents we have in this building, the knowledge and skills we have in this building to use different sort of programs and come at housing in creative ways is tremendous. We have a great staff here. We have a couple of challenges, however. One is we have a strong neighborhood-based sort of political system here. And right now, if you ask me, do we have an equal strong neighborhood base and a community-wide perspective, I think we might be a little bit out of balance. I'm being polite. <laughs> I think that needs to be rebalanced. I think we need to have entities that think strategically town-wide what's best for the town, and we need to have strong neighborhood entities, and they're nice to be give and take on both. And if we do that and we have the political will, I think there's a lot of interesting things we can do in this town. It's a great place. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, all right, so we, another technical uh, point here that I'm sorry I have to spend time on. Um, Yes, we, we can, we're going to ask our panelists to go sit at live mics up there so they can answer questions. But in order for members of our audience to speak and ask a question, you need to talk into this one because it's being uh, recorded by uh, Big. And if you sit out there, the folks who watch this on the um, video will not hear your voice. So. Um, I'm sorry to make things a little bit complicated, but the way we're going to have to do this is we're going to ask our panelists to move to the table, and then I'm going to suggest if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, that you kind of queue up along the wall over here, and we'll try to take you in order. And um, we've got about 40 minutes um, for questions and answers, so uh, I'm going to make, th these are general guidelines that the selectmen usually pursue, and that is, if the person in front of you has said the thing you plan to say, please don't repeat. Um, you can certainly ask questions. Um, we just would rather not have uh, the same questions over and over again, or the same comments over and over again. And um, is that what this chair is? I think once we get everybody up there settled, we'll 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 be able to start the Q and A. Are you, are you folks, check your mics, just tap it to make sure you're live. Yeah? Okay. All right. Very good. And then I'm just going to make one request as you come forward, if you identify yourself uh, before you speak, and obviously you are the first person in line. So. 
My name is Ann Lusk. I live at 18 Hart Street in Brookline. I have a PhD in architecture. I work on bicycle research, and I work at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. So if you wonder how I came to affordable housing, if you connect all three of those, you'll understand my question. I recently did research in Roxbury, asking people about bicycling, including bicycle parking. Because low-income people are nervous that their bicycle, their form of transportation will be stolen, many of them are carrying bicycles up three flights of stairs to park their bikes inside their individual <coughs> housing unit. They don't want to park a bike in a communal space because if your saddle is stolen, your pedals are stolen, you then don't have your form of transportation. Because you have been progressive tonight and you're really willing to look at innovative ideas, all I want to be able to do is email all four of you and suggest this idea to explore creating in housing unit bicycle parking so that a parent with a child on the back of the bike could wheel inside the housing unit, drop the child off the back of the bike, the child runs into the kitchen, you take the groceries off and there you are. I've already done research in Pine Street Inn and the residents there were extremely responsive to biking because it's their form of transportation. Second progressive idea. Because I look at cycle tracks, which are very protected bicycle facilities on the side of the road, I also study car parking. I also live in an 1820 workman's cottage in Brookline, and I don't have a parking space, because back then you had horses and carriages and maybe the shuttle, the T. Parking my car is very difficult. It means that I have to pay rent somewhere to park my car, and as the seniors in my neighborhood, Whiskey Point, which I will proudly call Whiskey Point, um, are not continuing to live there, uh, they're passing on, then the availability of car parking for people like me in, let's say, the brownstones is becoming a very limited resource. So I've talked to many people in affordable housing, including HUD, about funding affordable housing by selling individual parking spaces to area residents as a new novel way to then fund affordable housing and also to win the allegiance of the neighbors in that neighborhood because they then would be getting a benefit which is getting cars off the street and I suggest off the street because even if you have overnight parking you still put your car back on the road. So all I'm asking is if I could email all four of you with these two ideas. One is putting bike parking inside an individual unit and two funding the affordable housing by car parking and selling those parking spaces to area residents then I'd be appreciative. I'm going to suggest you email them to me, and okay. I'll forward it to them. Have. Okay, <laughs> yes, I do that all the time. She all knows. right, thanks a lot. Thank you. Could I just um, sure. respond? Go one, ahead. Just yeah. one thing that I thought was really unique in the town is when we developed 1754 Beacon um, as part of the cash flow for the project. The town required us to lease one of the spaces in the back of the building to a neighbor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's worked out, it's been great. It's, it's As we know on Beacon Hill there was the one parking space that was available for sale for $650,000. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It would have operated similar to a condo. Uh, there were other units that are outside on the ground for $350,000. So there is a resale value and it's better if you don't have to rent, if you can actually own the unit because then your housing unit appreciates in value if you can say I also have a deeded space that is my own that then goes with the house and you identify your zone around your your affordable housing and then sell units only to those people. Excuse me, quick question. Who plows the space if you own it? Who plow it would be similar to a condo association in that it would be a communal plowing and you would pay a condo association maintenance fee. Thank you. Try to clear that screen off. I'm not quite. Ah, Oop, nope, that didn't work. Okay, I'm going to try one more time. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's where I'm going. Uh, ah. Okay. Now that's less distracting. Sorry. Next. I'm I'm Frank Carroll. Uh, uh, among other things, I'm involved with the Brookline Community Aging Network and the Brookline Age Friendly City Initiative. I would uh, welcome some discussion explicitly uh, about affordable housing for seniors. 
And I say that, and we'd like you to talk about that uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is uh, we have a rapidly expanding uh, senior population, and we're going to ha have that going forward. Uh, aging baby boomers who are now entering old age are our most rapidly uh, growing sector of the, the, of the Brookline population in the last the decade, that uh, group, that group uh, some of who are represented in this room, uh, grew by 40 percent. And that's a, that going forward, that's a, a huge, going to be a huge need. And the other, other side of it is that uh, from a Brookline point of, of view, uh, th this is a, a relatively attractive uh, uh, a population to serve because they mostly don't have school children and uh, you know so for, from a town's cost point of view is the costs are relatively modest they uh, also if, if, if they are housed close to uh, public transportation uh, they need uh, less parking so you know there are kind of kind of lots of reasons to kind of look at that as a re relatively uh, attractive population to serve so I would have just appreciate some discussion explicitly about uh, possibilities for expanding affordable housing for seniors. Um, well, thank you, Frank. Uh, and I think that um, your, your efforts for um, CIN and age-friendly cities is much appreciated by, uh, by seniors in general. Um, uh, a couple of just two very different kinds of, of responses. I think when we think of senior housing, we tend to think of <coughs> multifamily <coughs> housing that's age restricted. Um, but um, th there's another kind of housing that is, um, uh, there's a lot of in Brookline that's pretty in invisible, but we, we might be uh, well advised to consider uh, formalizing uh, this a bit more, and that's um, what's known as accessory dwelling units. Um, th there, uh, there are a lot of, um, reasons why uh, existing homeowners and potentially uh, senior renters can um, can benefit at, at the at the advancing stages of their life for uh, having uh, access to accessory units in existing homes um, the uh, th th that type of housing while it benefits seniors is not strictly affordable housing as it's uh, it's, it's kind of formally defined because it's not it typically it's not deed restricted or or income restricted, but it, it does meet a growing need uh, in Brookline, and um, it's something that uh, that I think warrants uh, you know a closer look by anybody who's um, who's advocating for uh, for seniors in that regard. Um, regarding uh, uh, age restricted or senior housing in in general, what we know is senior housing. I think it's timely. Uh, I mentioned the the process that's about to begin uh, the housing housing production report. The first. Uh, uh, phase of that roughly six months effort is is actually going to be a housing needs uh, evaluation a housing needs study uh, including our steering group and the and our consultant so I think that we should probably have some um, intentional dialogue uh, to make sure that 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 the needs of seniors are properly identified and and captured in in, uh, in that exercise that we're about to uh, uh, that we're about to undertake. I might add that while the, uh, the prior effort to formalize um, zoning that recognizes accessory units uh, in Brookline, and this is something that AARP, for example, is advocating uh, nationally, while that did not um, succeed at, from a zoning standpoint, one thing that the uh, Housing Advisory Board and staff did uh, in cooperation with, the, uh, with the, the building department and the health department was to develop a short brief, which is posted on the um, on the town website and under the, the planning uh, community development department. It's uh, it's a description of um, what um, ho homeowners uh, who are concerned about aging in place and having suitable housing for the next stages of their life, things that they can do under existing town regulations to make their home uh, more suitable for themselves or possibly uh, extended family uh, in, in terms of uh, in-law or extended family living. So I'd invite anybody that's interested in that particular subject to have a look at it. If I could, um, um, Frank, I just lost you where they are. Um, I want to thank you for bringing that up. The two trends also that I want to add to what you've contributed is the fact that a matter that with, with increased longevity, we're all li living longer, and all the statistics say that most of us are not prepared financially 
to continue to live um, in accordance with our current standard of living. Uh, people just don't have money saved for the, the additional length of time. Um, and so not only do I think we have more seniors, but I think there uh, is a, it's a, it's a more, it's, it's a growing vulnerable population. And, and um, this trend towards, um, uh, well, the trend, the, the, the whole idea of living in place, I think, is hopefully giving way to a, what I think is a healthier trend, which is living in community, um, which is maintaining those social connections and the service connections you need so you can have an active uh, uh, senior um, life. And, um, and I think that when you give people an opportunity to go from living in a large structure that way you're over housed but isolated into living in a more appropriate structure where you're connected to services and relationships, uh, not only is it good for you, but it frees up housing stock for next generations to come and take advantage of living in this town. Just one, one other quick thing in terms of um, our housing goals and, and moving, uh, moving towards our 10% with new housing production. Um, clearly, um, from, this, from the town's fiscal standpoint, uh, other than meeting the needs of seniors, there's, a, there's a, a, a clear fiscal advantage to the extent that our production is, um, is directed at, at seniors. I see Henry Winkleman in the audience here, and I'd, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't fail to mention the fact that there's a, um, a, another town study besides the housing production plan that's a, a, about to be undertaken uh, has to do with the um, the uh, major sites that are owned or controlled by the town. And one idea that would seem to have some merit is um, on uh, one or more of the town-owned parking lots to retain the parking, but to develop uh, senior housing. Uh, and, and most likely it would be rental housing, which has some very major advantages in terms of the, the 40B rules um, uh, in, in locations that are, are um, you know, very much uh, meeting of seniors' needs to have a walkable surroundings and nearby commercial facilities. So I think that's something to, to <coughs> keep, keep an eye on. I'll just add that, uh, and I, I think I sort of touched on this a little bit in my presentation, but there's nothing incompatible necessarily with uh, uh, age-restricted housing or senior housing in Chapter 40R, uh, except uh, in situations where you had maybe a very small district that was limited to one parcel or project. Um, and I also uh, would just mention, in addition to sort of the friendly 40B, our lo local initiative program uh, type comprehensive permit, there's also something called local action units, which is um, essentially a way to uh, get municipally permitted uh, affordable units counted on the subsidized housing inventory. Um, and that's another uh, perhaps uh, in some cases more flexible uh, tool if, if there's a specific type of housing that's, that's desired. Okay, next question. And Hi. you're gonna have to pull that mic down a little bit <laughs> so you'll be heard. Story of my life. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, my name is Susan Granoff, and like Frank, uh, I'm active on Brookline Ken's uh, Advocacy Committee. And I've also done work directly with seniors who are living in Brookline Housing uh, Authority's senior housing. So I have three brief comments. My question uh, was kind of answered before I even asked it, which was, could the town take over the air rights above our parking lots and build senior housing there? And so I'm very happy that that's being considered because I think it's, it's a wonderful way of perhaps reaching that 10% mark that we're striving for. Um, the second point I wanted to just reiterate what David said at the beginning of his remarks, which is that there's some wonderful programs that we've heard about to enable lower income people to live in Brookline. And we all know that with property values going up the way they are, there's no problem about the wealthier uh, class of people living in Brookline. But my concern is that Brookline may very well lose the true middle class. And because the middle class people don't qualify for any of the programs that we've discussed tonight. So my question is, is any concern or consideration being given to helping middle class people stay in Brookline? Or are we no longer going to be a truly diverse economic community? 
Well, what, one, um, one thing that ad addresses that, I mean, any, any production is always uh, very limited relative to the demand, but um, Brookline has always um, uh, tried to do things that, that it feels is best for the community and, and not just because the state has certain prescribed categories. And, and an example of that is that uh, Chapter 40B only recognizes um, for affordable housing credit uh, people who mm -hmm. earn less than 80% of the area median income, not just Brookline's. Mm -hmm. And that, um, uh, th that's good to meet those needs, but it almost artificially segregates uh, the full market rate housing and this huge affordability gap between. We have, we've consciously um, uh, tried to keep um, uh, at least a, a sense of middle income housing on the table, for example, at, at, at Olmsted Hill, uh, to have different mixed incomes and not just under 80. You've got 80 to 100, 110. Uh, it, that, that doesn't close the affordable gap entirely, but it, act, it goes up and, and, and gives us some, some diversity in that sense. Um, it was a little disappointing that um, the original plan for St. Aidan's uh, also included a, a full range of mixed incomes. And as the cost of the project went up and then there was delays in litigation, we, some of us were disappointed that the, that targeted middle income group and those additional units were lost to the, uh, the financial feasibility numbers. Um, but um, th th that's, I think, one, one way of, uh, of looking at it. Yeah, I would just add that, I mean, that's certainly uh, something we talk about a lot um, at, at the state, and um, it's, it's a challenge. Um, there's certainly, you know, obviously nothing uh, with 40R or necessarily with 40B that would, um, or friendly 40B anyway, prevent uh, a community from uh, putting in a requirement at those thresholds. But uh, admittedly, there's no, at this point, really state, um, state incentive for that. Um, there is, you know, the Community Preservation Act, which allows for higher income thresholds, but that um, I don't believe uh, is available in Brookline. But the the, um, the the I think it's important to remember that we, we talked about the complexity of the funding for most of these development projects, and oftentimes the source of the funding is uh, will define income eligibility. So to the extent that the town has the flexibility to try to create these uh, higher eligibility levels, the challenge is still to find the package of funding that will allow us to do it. Brookline's inclusionary zoning um, is interesting in that regard because that's a locally grown concept that's been working for 20 years and has been um, creating affordable housing, not in huge numbers, but in several dozen different properties. And um, it's probably worth noting there that that bylaw, uh, unlike the state's more rigid formula, uh, calls for two-thirds of the, um, the town-grown affordable units under inclusionary zoning to be under 80 and allows one-third to be over 80. Mm -hmm. okay. And then the third comment that I had was actually on a state program that used to be very helpful to, uh, to preserving a middle class base in Brookline, but is no longer uh, really being uh, able to be utilized. And that is the circuit breaker tax break. Um, I don't know if anyone is familiar with that, but there's a two part requirement to enable uh, taxpayers to get approximately a little over $1,000 off of their state taxes uh, to compensate them for real estate taxes that they pay. Uh, they have to meet income requirements and their property has to meet a cutoff point in valuation. Now, what that has meant for Brookline residents in a place where our property values have been going up in the last three years, probably about 20%, uh, but at the same time, property values throughout the state, particularly in the western part of the state, have been declining precipitously. So over the last three, four years, the cutoff valuation for property has actually been decreasing on this CD, uh, circuit breaker, uh, tax break. Uh, 
three years ago, it was, I believe, around 720,000 or 714,000. Currently, it's about 690,000. So while the uh, property values are going up, fewer and fewer of Brookline residents can actually take advantage of that break, no matter how minimal their income is. And there, at one point, we thought, well, maybe it should be on a county basis as opposed to estimating. This, this is sounding to me like state legislation, not right. local but, municipal. But, I'm sorry but, to cut you off, but oh, there yes. are other people waiting, and we're going to run if, out of time. If people could do something to uh, put more of the state representatives and senators on notice that this, if they could eliminate the property valuation part of it, that would enable more of the senior citizens in Brookline who purchased property 20 and 30 years ago, but whose income is now very modest, to Thank afford you. to stay here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening. Um, I really appreciate the participation that you have all brought to the panel. It's been very um, informative and helpful, and I'm grateful to the League of Women Voters for making this one of their subjects of the year. Um, I have one comment and then a couple of questions. Uh, Roger Blood had indicated what some of the challenges are, and he talked about competitive interests in, in the land and referred to uh, schools and commercial development. I just want to add to that open space uh, where we have a lot of density in, in, in Brookline. Uh, open space is really a critical need as well. Um, question. I have been hearing that because we are approaching the 10% requirement um, of affordable housing in order to not be subject to 40B developments that we might not welcome, um, that we can look forward to kind of a deluge of 40B proposals as people try to get in under the 10% um, requirement. And so my question is, is there a way in which the town can ha add an overlay of requirement to any 40B project? If a 40B project now requires, I, I believe, Bill, you were saying 20%, 25% for senior um, as a proportion of the units that need to be affordable, could we, I'm aware, for example, of a, of a new development in Boston, which is one-third low income, one-third affordable, and one-third market. And I'm wondering whether it is possible for the town to put that kind of overlay on any further 40B projects. One, one thing that I love about the Housing Advisory Board is its embarrassment of riches as far as expertise in uh, not only affordable housing, but 40B, and um, I'm going to ask one of my colleagues if he might give you a more expert answer on that. I think the simple answer is no, but Mike Jacobs <laughs> can probably give you a little flesh around that bone. If he's able well, and I don't know, Bill, you might have something you want to say too, right? Uh, well, I could just, there was some conflating, I think, of a little bit of 40R and 40B Come on forward. I'm there. not stopping you. I'm just filling time. Just uh, with 40R, I suppose you could... Um, it's local zoning. It has to meet, so you have to meet that 20% at 80. But a community, and DHCD is charged with making sure that the zoning is feasible. So um, we have had communities who have um, uh, thrown out the idea of, you know, 30% affordability rather than 25. It never really came to a fru fruition where we had to make a determination on that because locally they just decided at the end of the day to do 25. Um, so, but that's, it's, it's certainly possible to propose that in the zoning. Okay. And if Mr. Jacobs would like to come and give uh, us some more. Yeah. <laughs> uh, under 40B at, at this point in time, uh, a community can propose that, but uh, it, would not, it would not be approved. Uh, there are certain programs which you're allowed to uh, 
apply under 40B, and you have to follow those programs through a subsidizing agency. So if the subsidized agency says the program minimum is 20 percent or 25 percent, a town can't impose a higher affordability requirement. Um, the subsidizing agency or the housing appeals committee, which ultimately a developer can appeal to, would simply throw that out. So that's not something a town can impose. That's disappointing. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to be focused because we do have another uh, person to speak at yes. least, and we're going to run out of time. Right. <clears throat> um, well, my, my next question relates to costs. And um, I'm, I'm on the board of BIC. I'm very happy that one of the town's best kept secrets got some attention this evening. Um, but our challenge at this point is, especially when it comes to finding properties and rehabbing them, is the cost and being able to move quickly enough, uh, which makes me a little curious about how long Pine Street Inn has owned Beale Street properties because I would have thought that those would have been terrifically expensive. Well, that, just, I'll be really quick, that is just a wonderful town story. So like 10 years ago, the town sent out a letter to every lodging house owner and said, if you are even thinking about selling, please call the Community Development Department. And the Schultz family, who owned the side-by-side -side Beale's properties did. Mm -hmm. The town introed us, and then we managed that building, those two buildings, for eight years. We, we set up an agreement with the Schultz family, and on Mrs. Schultz's death, we had the option to purchase the two buildings. Mm -hmm. And Mrs. Schultz was in her mid-90s when we signed the agreement, and she lived to be 103. <laughs> and, and so we managed the buildings for eight years very successfully. It worked for Mrs. Schultz and her family economically, and it worked for the Pine Street Inn. And then we had the option to purchase. Mm -hmm. So it was a very unique situation. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm, I'm just wondering if at some point there isn't going to be a need for doing some public fundraising or, I mean, like, like BIC is uh, a nonprofit, and, and should we be looking at uh, fundraising so that we do have the funds that are needed if we need to move quickly, more quickly than a developer, which all, who always gets there before we do? It's a challenge. One of the beauties of the, the town's housing trust fund, uh, the outgrowth of inclusionary zoning, not being subject to state rules and regulations, is that it has been used very, uh, very effectively, um, uh, not just for long-term uh, write-downs to reduce the costs of, of producing affordable housing, but as a, as a vehicle for exactly what we're talking about here, moving in and capturing control of a property just long enough so that it, it isn't um, exposed to the much higher uh, market prices that sellers are tempted to uh, to take. That's been done uh, several times. So there is at least that one uh, funding source um, mm -hmm. that uh, has that potential. We'd like to be your partner. Yes, <laughs> Thank we, ha you. And we have been. <laughs> Next person, come forward. Nope. She's evening. directing. <laughs> I think very well, I'd say. Uh, my name is Michael Kim. I am a Brookline architect. I, am also, I also happen to be the co-chair of the Multifamily Council at the Home Builders Association of Greater Boston. Um, my question, uh, with a little background, um, when a development of almost any size beyond, say, three units, um, actually six, I think, um, is built, there is an affordable component, which most often, and the most often, um, vehicle used is to have an affordable unit or two or whatever percentage in that development. Um, and we, I, I've been, been involved in projects that actually put affordable units on golf courses, on waterfronts, uh, and it, 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 it always strikes me that the one thing that all new housing has, has in common, uh, no matter Bill for what use is that they're really expensive, and it seems we're working against the market and against the entire industry to place affordable housing in new buildings. 
Uh, Brookline, somewhat less than other communities, but still has a wealth of older, decent, but less attractive buildings that uh, could be used for housing, and they are more affordable. Um, tonight was, in fact, the first time I've heard of the very small programs we have where there's essentially a linkage, uh, where developers can buy into a fund rather than um, placing those affordable units in their developments. How can we make the common sense of making used housing, affordable housing, the same thing that most of us who are not in the wealthy or the very poor, the middle class, choose to do? We buy used housing because it's what we can afford. Yes, the roof has to be replaced in 10 years. The kitchen may not be the best, but it is affordable. Why don't we have that vehicle uh, in our... We, we do. Okay. We do. Um, the, uh, the, I think the town has tried to strike a balance in that regard, and I, I, I think I can give you a, a, a good example of that. And in the, in the toolkit I mentioned, it's there, and we could do it again. Uh, it, the skills and the funds are there. Um, in the, um, when the original Longyear uh, estate was redeveloped, um, and it was subject to inclusionary zoning. I'm not talking about Olmstead Hill now, but the, the prior one uh, uh, at Longyear. And the, um, the bylaw at that time um, required on-site units and totally comparable. So uh, had it been just done blindly, we would have had maybe five or six uh, units of a million or two million dollars going to some, you know, winners of the most gigantic lottery in an affordable housing sense, you know, to get multi-million dollar units. Um, so the, um, the, the bylaw was modified and in a way that I think you might, you might approve of, um, whereby uh, the developer was uh, able to make, uh, there, were, there were two options. One is off-site development of housing, and the other is, a, is a, a, a contribution to the Affordable Trust Fund, where we can take that money and leverage it up, which you can't do with on-site housing, bring in additional resources. The upshot of that was we got, um, instead of five or six units, we got, I think, 14 or 15 total units um, one, of, one of which was the acquisition of a double three-decker for family housing, and uh, which was renovated uh, with these resources by, by uh, you know, the private developer, and then resold through, uh, through a lottery. And, um, and it's still very successful today uh, in Chestnut Hill. Um, an, another part of the resources that were moved off of these multi-million luxury units um, enabled the, um, the, the financing of a, of a lodging house, one of the lodging houses on Upper Beacon Street. So um, we ended up not only uh, greatly increasing the number of units, affordable units that came out, but we were able to serve a, a diverse populations in existing housing and making it permanently affordable. Um, so I think that we would be thrilled if that kind of opportunity came along again. And the regulations and the resources and the know-how are there to do it. And, and I would say I think the town is very open to using whatever leverage influence the town has um, to think about those kinds of things in a creative way. Well, we would certainly like <clears throat> to help you with that. I congratulate you for that. Uh, it's just that very few people in the industry know that that exists. And in, in fact, until tonight, I didn't know it existed in Brookline. And, and there are conflicting views that I think Brookline has had to reconcile in that regard. It's not, you know, not everybody sees what I just described to you as an ideal solution because, right. uh, and, and, and much of the housing is done on site because it has inherent advantage, advantages of having mixed income and diversity in a particular project. So. We, we're set up now to do both and try to, to do the best of both. Well, sometimes what you're doing is you're asking a developer with experience in new construction to get into the rehab business. Mm -hmm. So there's pros and cons on both, on both sides of it. Um, but again, we've got the tools. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Carol Carroll. My question is for David. David, in your presentation, you raised something which I found very alarming, and that has to do with modernizing the public housing that now exists in Brookline. How, how will that be financed? Is that a federal government finance? Is that local? I mean, how could something like that be done? Yeah, I said there was a need, and that's what we're looking at. I didn't say we've got the financing figured out, um, but 
part of the part of the problem actually is we've now had decades of, of being underfunded for capital repairs mm -hmm. for public housing. Um, and so it's just a, a huge gap there. We did a survey about, I don't know, five or six years ago where we had somebody come in and look at all our properties and get a cost as to what it would take to bring them all up to standard. We had something like a $30 million bill there. But, so, but, but who, whose responsibility would it be to, to uh, come up with the $30 million? It would be ours. Ours meaning local. Well, I'm the commissioner. I'm a commissioner in the Brookline Housing Authority, and we have the responsibility for the upkeep and, and running of those developments. And but quite the frank, sources are usually public funds. Yeah, they, I yeah. think maybe yeah. you go to you, you, you go. You know, it's why Dylan and uh, Rob Banks. You'd have to go where the money is, and and the money would either be the federal government or the private market. To go to the private market, you have to create a different kind of public housing configuration. That's not pure public housing. Um, so you have to be creative, but we were creative at Dummer Street. Right. And so we have a mix of, of, of financing that made that project doable and a commitment and a restriction that the people housed here would be the same profile as the people housed you see, in our... I, I understand yeah. Dummer Street, which, which by the way is wonderful, Thank you. Um, is that it's something new, but to finance improvements of something old is always yeah. much harder. Yes, all the easy stuff's been done. Right, <laughs> right. But so, what are you going to do? Right. <laughs> but the, one of the things that we really can't talk about now because we don't have enough time. But one of the kinds of possibilities is something that would be redevelopment, and that might give us an opportunity to do. Um, and it would depend on many, many complicated factors, but. If we were to take some of the uh, 40R and S concepts and think about mixed use as opposed to strictly housing operated by the housing authority in its own sort of island, okay? You gotta make a leap there to get to that kind of solution, but those are things that we should be discussing as we go forward, in my humble opinion. Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's yeah, sorry. May I just go back very, very quickly to uh, Marilise's comment? I think it's worth um, uh, picking up for just a moment on, on, on your remark about open space, which, which is a fourth competing use for, for sure. Um, it, 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 I think, r it raises an inter interesting question of what should affordable housing advocates do or not do? Um, I remember, um, this is a, a while back, that um, from, from that advocacy standpoint, uh, an idea was floated that um, a, 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 a way to produce affordable housing at a reasonable cost would be to reduce uh, Putterham Golf Course from 18 holes to 9 holes and build affordable housing up and down all of the greenways. Um, what, what's a proper place for affordable housing advocates to advocate and do we leave that for the green space advocates to come and argue the other side or do we, you know, do we hold back and say that's, that's, that's a bit too far? So it, 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 it does raise an interesting point about competing uses and advocacy. Could I, could I respond to that? that we need to build coalitions. Oh, right. We don't need to build divisive competition. This is about growing the pie, not splitting too small a pie. I'll use whatever metaphors I can think of. <laughs> uh, but we don't want to fight here. We want to build coalitions. Green space, you know, affordable housing should not suffer because of green space and vice versa. And the thing that I just want to, I want to mention about affordable housing, if, a, if building affordable housing in any way lowers the property values of the surrounding neighborhood or in any way denigrates the surrounding neighborhood, it shouldn't be done. Should not be done. It needs to be a positive, um, you know, contribution. So, quite frankly, I, I'm not all that fixated on 10%. What I'm fixated is how we're going to build housing, how we're going to build homes for people that are going to be part of our community and can stay in our community going to the forward. 10% yeah, ten, ten is, um, it's, a, it's a production goal, but it's a, a very much of the second dimension is it's a bogey for where we can then have some say about protecting our neighborhoods if we reach the 10%. And the interest is very much blended. Right. And, and I would say, in fairness, um, Brookline's uh, initiatives around affordable housing have, one, created permanently deed-restricted affordability, and two, 
had the flexibility to offer um, higher income eligibility levels and things like that, none of which are possible under 40B, but 40B unfortunately uh, seems to drive, let me say, drives the process because it kind of override, it overrides local zoning and um, because of that can often occur at a larger scale than is feasible uh, using local resources, so it's a real. A special thank you tonight to Betsy DeWitt for uh, pulling together this program and for moderating it. <laughs> and, a, and a very big thank you to the panel for bringing us a great deal of information on many different aspects. Uh, of the, the big issues of affordable housing. <laughs> this is a conversation that will surely go on for a good long time in Brookline and there are people in this room who share and then have many different uh, experiences and concerns uh, about the issue of affordability in housing uh, thank you to those people in the audience who raised some of those concerns with us here tonight. As we go on with the conversation, uh, the League of Women Voters will next have a discussion this Friday morning. We do on the second Friday of every month uh, an informal coffee gathering at Panera's at 9.30. Uh, people in the room are welcome to join us if you can. And the topics from tonight's program will be on our uh, discussion list for Friday morning. So thank you very much to everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, join us, if you will, on Friday. Uh, we hope uh, some of you in the room will consider joining us also as members of the League of Women Voters. Thank you.